Well, welcome again, uh, Stanley. Uh, today, in starting chapter ten, we come into what Bart said was the the center, the heart, the fountain of light. He says in the beginning of chapter ten, "Who's a Christian? A Christian is someone who confesses Jesus Christ as Lord." Uh, for Bart, it's Bart is a Christocentric thinker. What for you is the fruit of that way of thinking about God? It, it challenges all of our assumptions that uh, God is just the biggest thing in, that's around. Uh, <laughs> that uh, God is shown to be God in the life of Jesus Christ is going to challenge all presumptions about our assumption we know who God is, qua God, without revelation. So Bart quite rightly argues, I think, that the second article of the Creed is the article that it wants illumines, I believe in God, and I believe in the Holy Spirit, and those are all interconnected in ways that name the God who is to be found in the second person of the Trinity. Hmm. I think that one of the... Um, um, one of the aspects of Bart's Christology in Dogmatics and Outline can easily be overlooked in the sense that uh, Bart's Christology requires the complete life of Jesus, not in the East you have the incarnation embodied in Jesus' conception. So it is as if, and this is a oversimplification, in the East, all you need is Mary's impregnation. <laughs> in the West, the emphasis so oftentimes has been on the crucifixion for the satisfaction of, of sin. So all you need is the crucifixion account. Um, for Bart, you got to have the whole life. And that's, uh, uh, I think that's quite right. And uh, he, he, uh, he was criticized. Well, in, in chapter 14, he, he spends a whole section on Bethlehem. And Many have noted that most of the time in Western theology, when you're going to talk about what is the significance of Jesus Christ, what is his work, you, you go to you go to Golgotha, you go to the cross. Bart goes to Bethlehem, right. and rather than crucifixion, he stresses the uh, conception of Christ in the Holy Spirit. Uh, that is, that's a very different theological move than we normally took in the West. And it's, it, I mean, he says um, uh, on, in 17, uh, on 114, um, where he raises, he says, whereas the Eastern church brings more into the foreground the fact that he was raised for our justification. And so inclines toward the theologia gloria. In this matter, there is no sense in wanting to play one off against the other. You know, from the beginning, Luther strongly worked out the Western tendency, not the theologia gloria, but theologia crucis. What well, Luther meant by that is right, but we ought not to erect and fix any opposition, for there is no theological crucis that does not have as its complement the theologia gloria. I mean, that's, I think that's really um, his movement 
to have a much different uh, Christological account. Uh, and, and therefore, when you get to church dogmatics, uh, uh, 4.1 and 4.2, my favorite volumes, I mean, Jesus, he displays who Jesus was by going to the far country. So it is Jesus actually walking through Nazareth that is part of what it means for God to be revealed in this human being. Hmm. It, it is uh, uh, amazing how he <clears throat> kind of side, he, he, he doesn't indulge in argument about uh, the atonement atonement theories, rather, uh, he, he says somewhere in Church Dogmatics, <clears throat> uh, you know, conceived by the Holy Spirit, conceived in Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's clearly something God does. When he moves into his discussion of the creed about suffered on the Pontius Pilate, uh, crucified, that's kind of something humans do. And he he was criticized for sort of forsaking Luther's theology of the cross, whereas Bart says, but we're accomplishing everything that Luther did with his theology of the cross by stressing the miraculous God-given quality of Jesus' conception. And so it is um, a different place to begin. I, I would, what, it seems to me, uh, though making Christ at the center of the church dogmatics, making uh, taking 10 chapters here to talk about Christ, Christology, and this dogmatics and outline, Bart is really making a claim, and that is that we know nothing of God except in this Jew from Nazareth. Uh, we know nothing of the identity or the activity of God except in Christ, and that um, it, it may be, <clears throat> as Christians, we ought to, the Christological test is, is the test for everything. And it- You need to be a little careful, Will, with that, because, I mean, people tend to think that if you've got a high Christology, as Bart does, then you leave everyone else who isn't a Christian behind. But what Bart's high Christology does is make it absolutely necessary that you don't forget the Jews. <laughs> that, yeah. that, that now it is, you've, you, the God of Israel is the God who shows up in this Palestinian Jew, and therefore, hmm. the, how the life of Christ recapitulates Israel's life, uh, prophet, priest, and king. I mean, he, he makes a gesture toward Christ being those three great offices that reproduce Israel's um, relationship with God, which oftentimes was unfaithful, but nonetheless remained always pointing to the fact that Israel is Israel because this is the God who out of, out of absolute grace creates us and we didn't have to be. So you won't be surprised. Bart is never surprised. Uh, yeah. God showing up. You love that sentence in the Old Testament. Right. Yeah. You you love that sentence by Robert Jensen. Uh, God yeah. is whoever raised, whoever uh, brought Israel out of Egypt and raised, crucified Jesus. Yeah. Uh, that Jesus. God is whoever raised Jesus from the dead, having delivered Israel from Egypt. <laughs> you, you say that was the finest theological sentence ever written. 
It, it is. It's a great yeah. because you, you know, you know, resurrection now narrates God's deliverance from Egypt, uh, Israel from Egypt. So how involved in that sentence is a typological interpretation of how we read the Old Testament, mm -hmm. which is absolutely crucial. Uh, Jen's captured in that one sentence. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that that in that sentence, the crucial word is whoever, because what whoever does is remind you that you don't know who God is. You don't know until, God. Until mm -hmm. Jesus has been raised from the dead. Uh, 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 it's just, um, uh, um, Jen, you know, uh, the great body and interpretation. By putting Christology at the center, Bart also, he says this in various places in these chapters, um, that the person of Jesus Christ, God is not a concept. God is not an idea. God is not a principle. God is this person, this Jesus. And one thing that does is it provides a kind of theological test that we, we can't make the word God designate anything we think we need or we like um and that that seems to me crucial um i i, I noted for instance this is a trivial example but uh perhaps but uh when uh, uh <clears throat> evangelical defenders of trump for instance <clears throat> uh, albert moeller etc um uh when they're busy defending trump uh uh, as Christians, <clears throat> they never mentioned Jesus, and it it uh, it that uh, sometimes the theological move is to keep God as vague and indistinct as one can, and therefore one can make all sorts of claims, and one can say make all kinds of connections between you and God. Uh, Bart thinks it's so important keep rigidly focused upon this Jesus Christ. Uh, That's right. Um, I mean, his account of Pontius Pilate is so important because um, Pontius Pilate represents the absolute contingency of, <laughs> of our existence and the fact that Jesus is not the um, an instance of some general account of what it means for us to have intimations of eternity or something like that. What uh, Bart's um, uh, claim um, on 69, the message of Jesus Christ has nothing to do with myth. It is formally distinguished from it by its possessing a unique historical conception that it is said of a historical human being. It's just absolute contingent. <laughs> uh, when, he, when he gets to Pontius Pilate, he says uh, Pontius Pilate is there uh, to make darn sure you keep Jesus Christ in our time and in our place. This isn't some kind of mythological uh, rendition, <clears throat> it is it is excruciatingly historical, and the um, yeah um, that um, say more. We we're we're in chapter sixteen now when we talk when he talks about Pilate. Uh, that that's always seemed to me one of the wonderful parts of dogmatics and outline uh, is to note Pilate intruding into the creed. Uh, fine, mention, vin mention the Virgin Mary, but then uh, quickly after mentioning the Virgin Mary, uh, the only other, you know, human being mentioned is Pontius Pilate. What, um, I love that description. What, what are some ramifications? Yeah. I love that. Who is Pontius Pilate? Really an unpleasant and inconsiderable, an inconsiderable figure with a very unedifying character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and 
and and it, it is kind of amazing to make us say in the creed in a sense we believe in pontius pilate and and uh i don't know that i, I just that think grammar, that's amazing that that grammar we believe in pontius pilate i don't know that you need to believe in him he exists <laughs> oh, yeah, he, okay, he's there. Uh, he's just there. <laughs> which, which, uh, maybe a yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not accidental that Bart then says on one o nine, there's nothing in the opinion of Lessing that God's word is an eternal truth of reason and not an accidental truth of history. God's history is indeed an accidental truth of history, like this petty command that, I mean, uh, uh, I'm, so Lessing's ugly ditch, uh, how can eternal uh, truth be contingent on a particular human being? That ugly ditch of Lessing is not a ditch for Bart. There yeah. are no eternal truths of, of, uh, that are embodied in myth are universal philosophical claims that mm -hmm. one up Jesus. Uh, yeah. And, and I do, I do see the mention of Pontius Pilate. It, it, it becomes a, I think a wonderful kind of anchor that preserves Christianity from being spiritual. <laughs> it, uh, as, as we use spirituality, uh, these days, um, and uh, I, you, yeah, I don't want to miss. Um, uh, we emphasized how Bart has such a stake in um, the promise and covenant with Israel as leading to God's being very man in this. Mm -hmm. um, Jewish prophet named Jesus. Um, and um, of course, Bart uh, is responding to the failure of the church uh, in Nazi Germany to um, prevent the Holocaust. And um, he's, he acknowledges that he himself did not um, respond sufficiently to the Nazi condemnation of Judaism as Bonhoeffer did. And he goes after, though, not just the Nazis, but nationalism in general um, uh, as um, um, as the great um, event and behavior that makes Christianity uh, possibly less than true. Uh, I, um, uh, I just think that that cannot be overlooked. Yeah, and he... Uh... I see that in his uh, response, or the way he responded, or didn't respond to the Third Reich, but but even more so in the way he responded to communism. Uh, that, uh, yeah, it's it's serious, it's interesting, it is unsurprising, but to simply say the problem with communism is it isn't democratic, and so we want to stamp it out so. Uh, American democracy can flourish. Uh, Bart found problematic, and it, it seems to me he found it problematic in the way, much the way he treats Pontius Pilate is uh, he's specific. He is there. He is a fact, but he is not a fact that is allowed to determine the outcome or the story. Right. And so, he said, uh, communism is a is going to be a short life phenomenon. And uh, uh, not religious. I mean, what he liked about communism is not religious. 
<laughs> the Nazis had. Uh, yes, had at least, at least, um, well, um, the, um, you know, one more thing, uh, back to the Christmas, uh, back to the incarnation. Um, he has along the way a, a kind of uh, embrace of miracle. Uh, and this seems to me a theme that miracle is an embarrassment uh, for liberal religion from Slymacher on. And uh, liberal has somehow got to be interpreted, explained. Barth thought it was so important to take miracle as miracle and sees miracle as a kind of rebuke. Uh, you want to say anything about that? Where's the passage on that? Well, I, I can't remember. Well, he, he gets into mirror. Well, there in 14, uh, here, the, the oh, well. miracle of Christmas is the actual form of the mystery of the personal union of God and man. Uh, again and again, the Christian church and its theology. Uh, well, here that, then I can find maybe some others. He, I, in fact, he, the title of 14 is the mystery and the miracle, miracle. Of, of Christmas. And it's, it's almost like he wants to, rather than see in any way this is an embarrassment or something we're going to need to work with, he just rams it out there. It's a miracle. Yeah, uh, on page 100, he says, Okay. Uh, down toward the kind of two thirds down. What is involved is the mystery of the incarnation as the visible form of which the miracle takes place. We should ill have understood Mark II if we wanted to read the passage. That is the chief miracle as forgiveness of sin <laughs> and the bodily healing incidental. The one thing obviously belongs of necessity to the other. So we should have to give a warning to against uh, paraphrasing the miracle of the Navitatis and wanting to cling to the mystery as such. One thing may be definitely said that every time people want to fly from this miracle, a theology is at work, which has ceased to understand and honor the mystery as well as rather essay to conjure away the mystery of the unity of God and the man Jesus Christ. I mean, the point, again, you see... The mystery not, of God's free grace. Oh. What, he's, what he's resisting is coming up with a account of miracle and then saying, oh, Jesus performed some of these. But rather, the miracle, to use the language, is the God has chosen you, Mary, to carry the Messiah of Israel. That's where you start thinking about what you need to say about miracle. Mm -hmm. You don't you don't come up with something. And every no. and every other thing that we label as miraculous is a kind of outworking of the miracle of, of right. the incarnation. That's right. A and he uh, says early on in the Gerdigan dogmatics he talks about, you know, to to be to be squeamish about miracle is a sign of, of our unwillingness to let God be God. And um, using that language from back in Romans. Um, but uh, uh, it's kind of the essence of miracle to, to, that is God's freedom. Uh, God's freedom to act and in ways we don't uh, comprehend, understand, or can bring under our control. Uh, he notes somewhere in the dogmatics that Jesus performed healing miracles. But why didn't he perform healing miracles for all, uh, but just for a few? And he said, to even ask that question, again, we're nervous about God's freedom. Right. And, and we, we always find it uh, difficult uh, the blind man in John, um, uh, he, has, he has been made blind not because his parents sinned or he sinned, but because um, he's been waiting for me to cure him. <laughs> I mean, that. <laughs> uh, yeah, to, yeah, to show forth, uh, well, or there with Lazarus about uh, 
when when uh, Martha comes out and says, "Where the heck have you been?" He's been in the tomb three days, and Jesus says, "Oh, this was uh, <laughs> so that I could sh show my glory." And uh, uh, it, it, the um, I don't want us to skip over uh, uh, back to chapter eleven, where he gets into election, right. and uh, Bart has said uh, said in like volume two of the Church Dogmatics. The doctrine of election is the gospel in Nuche. In fact, if I were going for the linkage of like church and Israel, uh, Christ and Israel, I would probably not go first uh, to the incarnation and Mary. I, I'd go first to the election of sinful Israel. And um, uh, why? Well, here, I'll say that I would describe the mystery of election is simply that Deuteronomic wonder where God says, I will be your God and you will be my people. And in a sense, Bart says, everything flows out from that. Um, what, yeah. what do you think about the elect election as a core? Um, I mean, that's the, the, the debate between McCormick and Hunsinger about how to understand the significance of the election, whether um, there was a time that God was God without election. And um, I, um, I think that um, it's I tend to want to read all of that election. There was no time that God was not God in a way that God was not Trinity. So Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, which means we did not have to be, but God chose that we would never not be. I would. That's that's certainly my. I'm I'm prelapsarian. Uh, I think that you know once God is revealed to be the one who said, "I will be your God, and you will be my people," that is a supremely uh, second person of the Trinity uh, statement um, that that Jesus was not. God's plan B after God was frustrated by the failure to enact plan A, the prophets, the Ten Commandments, etc., that, that the Logos is who God is uh, from eternity. And uh, that seems very important. It, it also, I think, helps explain, uh, you know, that the the uh, the outworking is we experiencing that God is whoever the one is who said I will be your God, and that that's who I am from eternity, and uh, so it seems to me an important. Uh, uh, Bart broke with Calvin in Calvin's double predestination, God elects some but not all, uh, and. Uh, there have been times when people have asked me, uh, how can you as a Methodist, a Wesleyan, uh, read Bart? Well, I, I think this was one of Wesley's uh, theological affirmations is uh, salvation for all in that God is, I am your God, you are my people. And Bart has some great sermons on all. <laughs> I think that um, though um, there is um, the problem that he raises through Melanchthon, namely, you know, Christ through Christ's benefits. And Wesley certainly moved in that direction. He did. And Bart, and Bart wants to be very careful about mm. how that kind of association works because again it will open the door to pietism in a way that he wants to avoid right 
Yeah, I wasn't trying to make Wesley a Bardian. Um, <laughs> I was kind of explaining why I, I found, uh, and it should be noted that um, kind of latter day Arminianism uh, running rampant in among American evangelicals that Bart's doctrine of election is one of one of the reasons American evangelicals never, never, ever jive with Bart. And it's, oh. it, it is very interesting why I, I don't know how to explain that, that uh, they, uh, they find Bart uh, just uh, far too dogmatic, <laughs> I suppose. Uh, and the and they're looking uh, more experiential side, it, it, which is weird in in the sense that uh, I was having this conversation yesterday with an evangelical scholar, and he said, you know, Schleiermacher won; <laughs> he uh, triumphed uh, in American evangelicals, and that uh, I, I remember uh, when I was. Uh, and by the way, everybody, uh, you can solve the issue of Barton election by getting the book, How Odd of God, little thing there. Anyway, uh, but uh, I ran across two sermons on election, uh, by uh, one by Tim Keller and the other by John Piper, uh, two unabashed uh, neo-Calvinist or Calvinist on the rocks, really Calvin. And... Uh, in both the sermons, they asserted, hey, the doctrine of double predestination, some are saved, some are damned, uh, God, it's God's sovereign choice, etc." And then both preachers before they're done say, let me talk to you about how your life is made better through the doctrine of election. Uh, it is so reassuring. And uh, uh, Piper said something like, some of the greatest mission, courageous mission work I've known has been done by those who are certain that God is with them in their election, and et cetera. And, uh, uh, and uh, I thought, wow, it, it, the validation for the doctrine becomes us uh, and how we respond to it and all. So I... Uh... Would it's, go tricky. To the proof. it's tricky. Um, what you don't get in dogmatics and outline is a sense of Bart's um, moral passion in terms of how the narrative of Christ puts us in, as Christians, a frame for living life with the joy that um, makes possible um, a witness that others are attracted toward. You don't get that. Uh, Agreed. Uh, I would say that when you say that, you're sounding like Wesley has had some influence on you, but... Uh, he has. Yeah. <laughs> I... Uh, uh, often. And, and sometimes Bardians say, uh, hey, he didn't get to write his final uh, bringing it all together. He didn't get to do, uh, you know, he, he did this sort of volume five Christian life. Um, I, you know. I, 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 I agree. I, I just say this. Uh, one, uh, in Dog Max Outline, he's talking about the creed. And uh, isn't it interesting, the creed does not get into talk about sanctification, as I see it, uh, or, uh, or ethical passion. Uh, I think he's also, and I'm guilty of this, but in stro so strongly reacting against Pelagianism, uh, Arminianism, uh, self-help, uh, salvation, uh, maybe he overstates the divine work but I um do you think he over yeah no um uh I I I wish he had been more concrete in his ecclesiology but uh, that's a small matter I think uh we he, can maybe get into that uh 
next, next time the ecclesiology but uh that that yeah um i i wanted to i wanted to uh, uh give an account of when Bart delivered started to deliver um uh volume four on the mm -hmm. doctrine of reconciliation uh, i'm sure it, uh, in terms of the kind of spirit that he embodies in his clear and dogmatic and outline. He said, he started the lecture by saying, I had a dream last night and I dreamed that I died and I went to heaven and I had a little red wagon <laughs> with all 14 volumes of dogmatics and outline. And I got to the golden gates and Peter said, yes. And I said, I'm here. And Peter said, who's here? Carl Bart is here. And Peter looked puzzled and said, Carl Bart. He said, Carl Bart of the church dogmatics and pointed to his wagon with, uh, with the dogmatics. And Peter said, oh yes, won't you come in? And Bart said, I went down the street with the great glow <laughs> in the distance and um, the angels had lined the street and they laughed. <laughs> 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 they laughed at my pulling the, my 14 volumes. <laughs> they, they, and, yeah, one of the angels says, look at old Bart, he's tr bringing along all these big heavy books with him and it, uh, uh, which was part of the uh, I, I will say, I, I think at his best, he applied this sort of sweeping, gracious election of God to himself uh, and enabled him to have that kind of humor about his own achievements. Uh, the, I find in his talk about election and his talk about, hey, Christmas, the incarnation, uh, a, a real challenge to the rampant Pelagianism uh, that like American theology became. Uh, I mean, it's interesting that his re revolution began with the reading of Romans and uh, also the creed. Uh, well, well, liberal preachers like me uh, love to preach from the gospels and in the gospel, when you're preaching in the gospels, you can so quickly make a move from the actions of Christ to human actions. And that's the typical sermon move. Uh, Paul, who refuses to quote anything from Jesus or uh, talk about uh, his parables or his work and all, uh, uh, makes that move more difficult. And I think that is Bart, that Jesus Christ is not primarily an exemplar, uh, Jesus Christ is here as the one who is God saying, I will be your God, and you will be my people. Uh, um, do, you, do you find in here, uh, what we've gone through thus far, do you find inadequate support for the Christian life, Christian living? No, I, what, I, what I don't get and it's the creed. What I don't get is any exemplification of it. Um, who are the examples that you want to hold up? Is, um, and of course, Bart would have- to Well, well he's giving you Pontius Pilate, but uh, <laughs> is, is, <laughs> that's okay. That's an example of something, but yeah. Okay. Um, right. I, I, I mean, it, it just, um, Bart, I suspect, distrust exemplification. And as an old era, I think that's fair to for say. Me, for me, <laughs> exemplification is everything. And I think, yeah. I think he provides the basis for it. He just won't do it. Yeah, and, and I think, along with that, I think he was so completely convinced that um, being a Christian is to know something. Uh, to know Jesus Christ. And he, I think he just had such faith in the power 
of that knowledge that 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 uh, and thinking that if we can just get the story right uh, if, if we can render Jesus Christ as as he is rendered in the creed and all that that the rest will follow now I bet you could challenge that assumption if that's his assumption um, what did you make will of um, of his uh, moving to Nicaea um, and um, it, on page 85, he says, we have now reached the point where I can let the text of the confession of the early church proclaimed against the background of the discussion on the question of the divinity of Christ speak to you. And then he, he gives basically Nicaea. That's interesting that he, he, he seemed to think hmm. that he, he needed to supplement. Um, to me, I thought he was making a kind of Chalcedonian move, uh, uh, stressing that, and th this occurs under chapter 13, Our Lord. Um, mm -hmm. However, I did, to me, the do the, this dogmatics and outline, it is so interesting that it is from the Apostles' Creed. What is the Apostles' Creed? It's a recitation of, of history. Uh, uh, God's history with us in Jesus Christ in the way that Nicaea uh, is not. I, I've often wondered what if Bart had decided to take Nicaea as his dogmatics and outline and I think you'd have gotten a very different rendition. Were you bothered by that move uh, to no, Nicaea? I was, just, I was just puzzled. Yeah, I, me too. By it. I, uh, that uh, um, uh, that he felt, um, uh, I mean, he does it again on 86, uh, that it, yeah. it's not like something is deficient in the Apostles' Creed. Mm -hmm. It's just you need further elaboration somehow. I, I don't want us to, um, um, to uh, end our discussion without calling the attention to Dorothy Sayers. I mean, okay. that, that, um, he um, he was reading Dorothy Sayers' um, great um, uh, play uh, of uh, Jesus uh, uh, in the Gospel. Uh, I think is um, you wonder how did he find Dorothy Sayers? <laughs> Just and, amazing. And, and I think one he loved murder mysteries, <laughs> and so and she wrote, of course, yeah. great. Uh, a series uh, yeah. uh, of murder mysteries. So I suspect he found it that way. But I was, now, now she did uh, Creed and Chaos was one of her books. Wasn't that Creed, Creed or Chaos? Creed, uh-huh, right. Yeah, and I wonder, yeah, I, I would think he would resonate with much of that. Uh, before we leave uh, and get into the questions that just to tag I love chapter 18 uh, Jesus in hell um, mm -hmm. that I think to me uh, I relate back to chapter 11 election uh, once you get a God that is so totally committed to be God with us uh, it's like he's, he's this is the God that's going to end up in hell and uh, harrowing hell uh, this God is is so relentlessly redemptive. Um, this is what you get, and it just seems kind of wonderful. Uh, Methodist uh, excised that phrase from the creed early on because it was we were too sensitive about it. But uh, I think it's a quite wonderfully incarnational statement. Yeah. What, what work do you think that does in the creed? Um, he descended. I think it it shows God's respect for our sinfulness, huh. and that um, and that we can really mess our lives. 
make them house. Okay, I, I would say uh, yes, but also not simply God's respect for our sinfulness, but God's determination to be God, even in hell. And uh, uh, Bart, you know, as you know, was accused of not taking sin seriously enough, uh, not giving sin any kind of independent, uh, we don't give anything in independent existence, but um, it seems to me that uh, when you get a God that is, uh, comes through the impregnation of Mary, uh, then don't be surprised uh, to find that God uh, refusing, it, it, you know, not to uh, be in hell. On sin, I think Bart is absolutely right. And it has Jesus as Lord. Jesus' salvation is not a response to sin because what God does in Christ is a new creation in which sin doesn't get to determine what the character of that new creation is going to be. And, and, well said. And, and so Bart refuses uh, to let sin become the defining character of who we are. You only know sin on your way out of it, per Bart. And that strikes me as just true. I mean, uh, you and I were raised on the tents, and the tents were presupposed that if you made people feel guilty enough about their sins, then maybe they would come mm -hmm. and declare their loyalty. Well, of course, that's getting it absolutely bass backwards. Yeah, he hated that. And this, if Jesus Christ is Lord, then uh, you really can't give uh, any glory uh, to human sin or any sovereignty that, that Jesus Christ is determinative of everything, in, including our sin. And therefore, he famously speaks of sin as das Nichtige, the, the, the nothing. nothing. And uh, it's real, but it's unreal. And it is uh, serious but not ultimately serious. And so uh, therefore you get this kind of ultimate triumph in hell. Uh, okay, let's, let's go to our uh, questions or comments, uh, Karsten. Yeah, sure. So um, since we missed chapter nine last week, and this happens to be um, the week that we'll be celebrating Ascension on Sunday, um, there are some questions about sort of how Bart thinks about heaven and earth. And I think that ties in really well with the ascension when we have Jesus ascending into heaven, um, sort of a New Testament cosmology that doesn't um, make a lot of sense to space age uh, folks. So maybe, could you all talk about the significance of the ascension um, and maybe pull us into chapter 19 there on 125 and 126 and maybe kind of what that says about how Bart thinks about heaven and earth. Hmm. Yeah, and he gets into the ascension in, in chapter 19. Stanley, what, what, how does the ascension work here? First of all, there's a wonderful book by Doug Ferrer on the ascension, which tends not to be um, given appropriate emphasis as part of Jesus' life. That um, um, I, I want to highly recommend that book. and the importance of the ascension, establishing Jesus' as lordship over all um, uh, creation, and that Jesus ascends to the right hand of the Father is the clear establishment of lordship. Rule. Uh, and that is absolutely crucial as part of his ongoing life. I mean, yeah, he, he, he doesn't like to use the word omnipotent, but boy, he does here in, in 19, uh, that this is omnipotence. He also says, it is so important to keep 
ascension, resurrection as one movement, that that Jesus Christ not only uh, in resurrection death is defeated, but also he reigns. He he defeats death in order to uh, to reign. Uh, and Bart has on one thirty, death is timeless. Nothingness is timeless. <laughs> Jesus redeems time, makes time real. Mm -hmm. mm. Because that's and creates the you can you can you can narrate creation. Creation is a narrative because this is time. Mm -hmm. that, that you know, in Carson's question, he said uh, he was talking about how do you make this credible to modern people with uh, our cosmologies are different than the heaven and earth kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a challenge. I think a greater challenge is uh, modernity deludes us into thinking that that we reign, that we are on the throne, and. Uh, if if we can just get enough good medical research, we can we can defeat this uh, COVID nineteen. And um, when I hear about Jesus preached in my church family, Jesus is at best a kind of empathetic, caring uh, friend uh, who you know says, I, "I'm just so sorry this happened to you." Man for others. I mean, the Bonhoeffer phrase has turned into generalized humanism. Uh, yeah, and uh, but but I think Bart, through the creed, would have us say, no, he he's actually better than that. He, he's actually omnipotent. He is reigning, and uh, that that is a claim that I think is uh, is a real challenge. Uh, Carson, that phrase that you used um, in terms that we have a different cosmology, you didn't get that from Boltman, did you? No, I've done my best I mean, to steer clear of that one. That was uh, Rudolf Boltman made um, a life uh, time of suggesting that um, we could know as Christians no longer reproduce a, a storied universe, storied and storied one, story two. Uh, and therefore, you have to demythologize the Gospels, uh, which did, turned out not to leave much space for the Gospels. That's who Bart is thinking of when he's talking about myth. He's, yeah. He's going after. Sadly, Bootman is dead, uh, it, and it it is. I, I've wondered. Uh, Carson and I've had this conversation, in fact, about if you if you don't know Bootman, if you haven't read him, then do you miss a lot of Bart? Because Bart is busy attacking him uh, without it, without mentioning him. Yeah. Uh, Karsten, got another one? Yeah. So in the Savior and Servant chapter, um, chapter 11, Bart does a lot of work with his theology of Israel. And I think he's, he's well known for um, sort of sketching out a non-supersessionist theology of Israel, which became... Well, that's debated. Right. Um, <laughs> but, so there's there's kind of three terms that came up in the... When we're talking about Israel, especially now, um, that came up in several different questions. Where we have Jews, um, and then we have Judaisms, which I think for, like, Bart on 81 is represented in the synagogue and the Jews who are not part of the Christian church. Um, and then there are also questions about Zionism and the modern nation state of Israel. So how do y'all as um, people who follow Bart, but maybe not entirely in these kind of questions, um, how do y'all how think about sort of those three terms? Um, first of all, it is a very silly Christian that is going to get between Jews debating one another. Uh, and so uh, Zionism um, is not for Christians to uh, have a 
position about. Um, I think um, the fundamental move in terms of responding to those three is to say there is, um, as Bart, Romans 9 through 11 remains um, true, the promise to Israel now at, in, in continuity of Jews um, with that election um, uh, is true. And that um, if God, if, if Christians were ever um, able to work out their animosity toward Judaism and their fear of Jews by killing every Jew, then um, God would destroy the world. Um, the, um, the continuing promise to, to Jews and Israel is uh, unbroken. I think, like you said, it is that is a hotly debated topic uh, with Bart and all. Um, I, I just say this, that where Bart Bart has got the same problems with Judaism, Judaism, since you ask about that, uh, that he has with the church. <laughs> he thinks, unfortunately, uh, both are religion, and that's, re he's, so religion. Uh, he also, uh, back to chapter 11 on election, he, he always talks about God loves sinful Israel. And he thinks it's so important to say sinful Israel. But when he's saying that, he's not criticizing Jews and he's not criticizing Israel. He's noting about this is the nature of the one who loves sinners and saves sinners. And, and, uh, but it is, Bart says things that I feel he surely would be more careful in saying now after the Holocaust, etc. I was uh, one, once having uh, dinner with Peter Oakes and Michael Wishagrod, and um, we were talking about these matters. And Michael said, looked over to me, and he said, "You know, we Jews are a stiff-necked people. <laughs> <laughs> we really are." He yeah. said, you, "You Christians aren't. You, you can't criticize us. Uh, we're too good at." at criticizing ourselves. And um, a book that peop, uh, is Sonda Rieger's uh, early book on Bart and the Jews is really uh, an important book to read. It is. And, and Bart loved pointing out repeatedly that Israel means to contend against God. And it does not mean to contend with God. It means to contend against God. And, and that he said, we're all Jews. I mean, we're all Israel and that we, Israel is beautifully contends against God and is the one uh, that he also, Bart, um, just reading the other day about how he, he was, he did much that, that, that Israel through Abraham, you know, Abraham is to, Israel is to be a light to the nations. But he makes the point about God doesn't love Israel in any instrumental utilitarian way, like I'm going to love Israel in order that I can make Israel a showcase to the world, even though I am making Israel a showcase to the world. I'm gonna love Israel because I love Israel. And that's who I am. Well, here our time is about done. Uh, Stanley, could you close us in prayer? I knew you were doing this. I took time to write one. Lord of time, we feel, we feel we live in an uncertain time, but then we are no longer sure we know what a certain time may be. That your son ended up on a cross should have made us think twice about our assumption we know where we are in time. In the meantime, we ask for your guidance that we may know how to go on when we're not sure where we are. 
We give thanks for your giving us Karl Barth, whose witness stuns us, making possible a recognition that we are creatures that need one another. Draw us close to you as we are distant from one another. So drawn, may the world see that we are not abandoned. Amen. Amen. Well, we'll see you next week. <laughs>